are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, 12s. This is Corbin Smith, your host for Locked On Seahawks. Joining me for our Blue Friday episode, my co-host, Nick Lee. The Seahawks have a big Monday night football game coming up on Monday against the Saints at Lumen Field. They're going to try to get their first victory at home this season. Still really weird saying that, that the Seahawks have lost their first two games at Lumen Field so far this year. And they need to win badly, sitting at 2-4, and four, last place in the NFC West to keep their slim playoff hopes alive as we approach the midway point of the season. This is a game they absolutely must have. So Nick and I are going to be breaking down some keys to victory as the Seahawks prepare to host the Saints, and we'll dish out our weekly picks to click. So let's get rolling. This episode of Locked on Seahawks is brought to you by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's an unofficial community center. A big thank you to our friends at McDonald's for always being there. I'm loving it. Now for your lead story here on Locked on Seahawks. The Seahawks will be inducting a 13th member into the ring of honor at halftime in Monday's game against the Saints. And who more to be fitting for this honor, considering the opponent, than quarterback Matt Hasselbeck. The last game that he played for the Seahawks was that glorious home wildcard victory over the Saints. That was the last home game he played in as a Seahawk. And through multiple touchdowns, everybody remembers the beast quake. But Hasselbeck, that was one of the best games that he played in his 10 seasons with the Seahawks. It was a fitting ending for him. So really, this is the perfect opponent to celebrate his career and put his number eight up in the rafters. I'm having a hard time believing that this is a coincidence, that it's against the Saints on Monday Night Football. Um, what an honor for him. I'm really excited for him. And yeah, it's very fitting that he's he's doing this against the Saints. And, and people forget, yes, of course, the Beast Quake was an absolutely legendary play heard across the world. Um, but Matt Hasselbeck balled out in that game, too. I, I, he, he had some, some good numbers, 272 passing yards, four touchdowns, and 113 uh, passer rating. So along with that beast quake, he also, Matt Hasselbeck himself was inter- instrumental in winning that big playoff game, that big upset, and and did cement his legacy as, as part of, of, of the Ring of Honor with the Seahawks. I'm not, I, I think he still is in the Ring of Honor without that game, um, but that was certainly a, a great punctuation mark to a great Seahawks career. Yeah, one of the best quarterbacks in franchise history. And I think before Russell Wilson came along in 2012, you could have debated that Hasselbeck was the best quarterback that they had ever had. In the 10 years that he was under center, they made the playoffs multiple times. They made their first Super Bowl in 2005. He was a three-time Pro Bowler. Didn't put up the gaudiest of numbers. Obviously, Russell Wilson has since passed him for the franchise mark. Uh, He and Dave Craig both being the number two and three quarterbacks in passing touchdowns, but Hasselbeck was actually number one in passing yardage, and Wilson recently passed him in that mark as well. But a fantastic career, and it didn't always look like it was going to be that way. We actually had a chance to talk to Hasselbeck, the Seattle media today, preparing for this Ring of Honor ceremony, and it was a bumpy ride the first couple years after Mike Holmgren, who had helped draft Matt Hasselbeck out of Boston College when he was with the Packers in 1998. It was a sixth-round pick. Uh, not a player that had much pre-draft buzz. He only had one scout at his pro day, as he was saying. So not like he was a top quarterback prospect, but Mike Holmgren saw something in him, drafted him, still had Brett Favre on the roster, and Hasselbeck was joking, you know, I, I didn't feel like Holmgren was coaching me. I was just allowed to be there at practice. But it was really invaluable for him getting to see how Mike Holmgren coached Brett Favre, how hard he coached Brett Favre, and obviously Joe Montana, Steve Young in San Francisco, he coached them as well, being an offensive coordinator, working with quarterbacks. So a number of great quarterbacks that Mike Holmgren molded, and and, uh, Matt Hasselbeck was another one of them. In the first couple years after they traded for him in 2001, he lost his starting job at one point to Trent Dilfer. They benched him because he was struggling 
And maybe he had too high of expectations for how he was going to play coming in. He thought, oh, the regular season is going to be like the preseason. And uh, sure enough, that was not the case. And he struggled. But Mike Holmgren coached him really hard. He figured out what he needed to do. And eventually, he was able to get this Seahawks team over the hump. Like I said, getting to the Super Bowl in 2005, coming up just short against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Very accurate and outstanding leader. Very smart football IQ. Very coachable player, especially after the first couple of years in Seattle, really improved in that regard. And so he will always be viewed as one of the best quarterbacks they've ever had and really helped usher in the era that really set up the success the Seahawks have had for the last decade. Hasselbeck, Walter Jones, Sean Alexander, Steve Hutchinson, those guys, they built the foundation by taking this team to a place that had never been before. That was the building block that allowed Pete Carroll and company to come in and take that next step where they were able to win a Super Bowl and get back to a second one. And we know make the playoffs eight of the past nine seasons. And Hasselbeck, man, he he rubbed some elbows with some serious dudes as far as the coaching of Andy Reid and Mike Holmgren in Green Bay at Brett Favre, as you mentioned. And I think he's also a dying breed of guys who are unheralded coming out of the draft that sit for a while and and kind of learn on the sidelines before becoming uh, a great starting quarterback that that's something that we don't see a lot because th- in this day and age you know we're always anxious to start right off the bat week one game one year one the, not that he was a top tier draft pick but these, these quarterbacks that we think in college are going to be the next franchise face the you know Trevor Lawrence's Zach Wilson's Justin Fields those guys and uh, sometimes it just it, it, not every not every path is is paved the same way towards being a great quarterback. And I think Matt Hasselbeck showed that. And, um, you know, I, I think also I've always thought that Beast Quake play was very symbolic as well because, as you mentioned, that, that was that was his last game and the last home game. And uh, Marshawn Lynch was a relatively new Seahawk at the time, and that really was literally Matt Hasselbeck and that era, the Hutchinson and Jones and Sean Alexander area era, Handing the era off, or handing the the keys to Russ or uh, Marshawn Lynch, handing the ball off to Marshawn Lynch to usher in that new era of Seahawks football. I think that was a very symbolic um, play, and because as we know, Marshawn Lynch was extremely instrumental in establishing the identity of that Super Bowl winning team in 2013, and just the dominance um, of the year before and a few years after that Super Bowl win. That that really that play that Beastquake kind of really was the changing of of the eras of Seahawks football, and Matt Hasselbeck was smack in the middle of that. Yeah, it was a changing of the guard, there's no doubt. And it's funny, you look back at that 2010 team, everybody's always going to remember that wild card victory, a 7-9 and nine team upsetting the defending champions, the New Orleans Saints, at home. Now, everybody's going to always remember that win, in large part because of Beast Quake, the run, and the fact that this was a team with a losing record, and they pulled off that huge upset. But this is a team that was playing better football down the stretch. And really, that was the year that really set things in motion. Marshawn Lynch and company didn't get back to the playoffs in 2011. But once they had Russell Wilson, some of those other young building blocks were on the roster the next year. They had your Richard Shermans and Cam Chance of the world there. Uh, K.J. Wright, they were starting to really build the foundation for that team. And, And I think that that squad getting a win in the playoffs really was a big deal for the trajectory of where the Seahawks were going. Even if they had one year that was kind of a hiccup from a record standpoint, it really was the season that set everything in motion. And Hasselbeck was talking about today, he didn't know that he was going to like playing for a rah-rah coach like Pete Carroll, seeing quarterbacks and everybody else going through bag drills before practice and the charisma. He didn't really know at first if he was going to like that. He ended up loving it, so he really enjoyed that last season that he played in Seattle. And he said if he was ever a coach, he would take a lot of the things Pete Carroll does and he would implement them into how he does things. And so it really opened his mind to a lot of different things that he hadn't seen early in his career with Mike Holmgren as his head coach. And so really it was just interesting looking to that perspective. But one of the best careers for a quarterback in Seattle, absolutely deserving of having his number up in the Raptors. I know it's going to be really exciting for him and his family, for Seahawk fans, having a chance to enjoy that at halftime with him. Being in the stands, thank goodness that we're back in the stands. So it's going to be a lot of fun on Monday night. And I agree with you. I think that they picked the Saints game for a reason. I don't think that this was an accident. I'm pretty sure that they looked at the schedule Monday night, Saints coming to town, perfect game to 
put Matt Hasselbeck in the ring of honor. So it's going to go down on Monday night, going to be really exciting. When we come back in the second quarter, we're going to actually talk about what's going on on the field during that game, sandwiched around Matt Hasselbeck's induction. We're going to be looking at keys to victory for the Seahawks against the Saints. When we return, you're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We're back and better than ever. A new web interface for the start of the basketball season and more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the basketball and football action this season. Head to our new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Use the promo code LOCKED ON to receive your bonus. Whether it's basketball, football, baseball, NHL, boxing, or UFC, don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports. Bet online where the game starts. Welcome back to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, Blue Friday edition. This is your host, Corbin Smith, joined by Nick Lee. The 2-4 and four Seahawks badly need a win. They're heading back home. They get two straight home games for the first time this year, and they'll be taking on a very good 3-2 and two Saints squad. They've been winning games a bit differently than earlier Saints teams, not putting up quite as many points. The passing game not being a big part of that, and this is a team with a very stout defense from front to back. So a little different opponent, but they've got a different blueprint, and they're still winning games consistently. This is going to be a tough game for the Seahawks. Nick, let's talk keys to victory. Seattle almost pulled off the road victory in Pittsburgh. They almost beat the Rams the week before. That has really been the tale of the season, almost getting there and not being able to finish, not playing four quarters. Let's talk keys to victory on offense for the Seahawks. How can they beat this Saints squad that comes in off a bye? They won their last game. Seems like they're getting healthier coming out of the bye. What can Seattle do on offense to end up getting the victory? Well, they're going to find out really quick if they can if they're going to be able to make any sort of noise in the NFC playoff picture with the run game because they were going up they're going to go up against the number 2 running defense in the Saints and the Seahawks need to run the ball. Cuz I don't know if you've heard Geno Smith is the one playing quarterback and not Russell Wilson. And so I, I think the the obvious thing coming out of that Pittsburgh game was that the Seahawks can and should focus on the run. I think that Russ or uh, Pete Carroll was going to establish the run in that third quarter or die trying. And luckily, I mean, even though they did lose the game, they found maybe they found themselves a bit in a loss. And uh, with Alex Collins, who's been an absolute re- revelation, Rashad Penny perhaps can pr- produce a, a bit of juice behind uh, Collins. And I, I think that this is a game that's right off the bat, you're going to be put to the test is can the Seahawks rely on that run game enough to win a home game? against a team that has a pretty darn good run defense because there is no ifs, ands, or buts. The Seahawks need to run the football to win this game. The Seahawks will not be able to win this game relying on Geno Smith airing it out with the secondary that they have. So the, the, the Seahawks absolutely need to be prepared to establish the run right up front. You know, the offensive linemen are going to be excited to be on the attack instead of dropping back and pass pro. And, you know, the guys like Alex Collins and Rashad Penny, especially Rashad Penny, I imagine, will be very eager to get out there and and put some stats on, on the 2021 box score for him and, and get this game going. I think that, you know, I, I have my own opinions of Rashad Penny and how that's gone, but the ability is still there. And I think behind Alex Collins, that adds another element to this run game that they didn't even have last week against the Steelers, who also aren't a terrible run defense team. So they just need to establish the run and, and maybe, you know, die trying if, if need be. Yeah, I think running the football is going to be imperative. And here's the thing. I'm not expecting the Seahawks to come out and run the way they did that opening drive against the Steelers. That's going to be extremely difficult to do against this Saints defense. They're just so disciplined with their gaps. They don't miss a lot of tackles. It's weird saying that because the Saints, like, seven or eight years ago were, like, where the Seahawks defense has been at the last two years. They couldn't stop anyone. But – This has become a really good defense the last couple of years. And really, that's the backbone of this Saints team. They are a defensive football team, first and foremost, and their run defense is outstanding. That being said, Seattle has to have balance. They've got to have something to complement Geno Smith. And I think that they can get it done. I expect Alex Collins is going to play in this game, even though he didn't practice on Thursday. 
I expect he's going to be ready to start. They're going to have Rashad Penny back. He could have returned a few weeks ago, but they gave him a little extra time to ensure he's 100% healthy, work on his conditioning. He should be ready to go and, and be able to tote the rock 10-plus times as long as he can avoid another injury. That's been the big issue for him. But he's going to add another element if he's healthy, the explosion, the speed, that third gear. You put him with Collins. I thought DJ Dallas and Travis Homer looked pretty good in limited opportunities against the Steelers as well. They've got a quartet of running backs there that all have little different skill sets. They can run the football. It's just going to come down to can the offensive line play the way it did in the second half against Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh had a good run defense going into that game, so it's not like they were running on a slouch defense. They were able to move the ball against a team that has a lot of talent and normally stops the run well. So that is a good omen coming to this game. Now, when you're talking about the passing game, everybody's going to want the deep ball because you've got DK Metcalf, you've got Tyler Lockett. Geno Smith has enough of an arm to do it, but you mentioned the Saints secondary. They right now rank second in the NFL interceptions, and they have done it in five games, not six. And so this is a really difficult team to throw the ball downfield on. They're opportunistic. That aggressiveness could be used against them some, but I think this is a game – where that intermediate passing game, your 10 to 15 yard passes, particularly in the middle of the field, I think that's where you can get this Saints defense. I don't think you're going to have a lot of chances to beat them vertically downfield because of their secondary, but their pass rush has been iffy at best. I think those 10 to 15 yard throws, tight ends, your slot receivers, you can get your outside receivers running routes to the interior as well, but I think that is where the sweet spot is going to be. And I think if you're able to run the ball, and you can get that intermediate passing game, particularly between the hashes going, that could be what breaks the floodgates, so to speak. And you could have a few deep balls later in the game that come your way. Yeah, they, they have a heck of a secondary. You know, you think of guys like Marshawn Lattimore, who's allowing, after 31 targets, less than 70, a less than 70 passer rating. Malcolm Jenkins at safety, a less than a 50 passer rating. Yeah. And he's, he's a... a a fantastic safety. I think that this is maybe one of the better secondaries Sean Payton's had. Debo has been outstanding too. Yeah, Wilson Debo, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. He's been uh, nothing short of a rev revelation as well. In fact, he leads the team in targets against and still maintains an 80 passer rating against. So he he's also having a, a fantastic year. So yeah, I agree. It's 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 one it's one of those typical take what you what they give you kind of kind of games because if you start forcing the issue. And giving the the Saints a short field on some turnovers, that can that's when it can get ugly, especially when you got. I know we'll talk about him, Alvin Kamara and the company on the other side. You don't want to you don't want to out Jameis Winston, Jameis Winston by start forcing throws and and being a gunslinger, a gunslinger and and making uh, decisions that are that are less than uh, optimal. And you you just don't want to have that situation. So establish the run, make smart passes, don't force the issue. And they got to finish. I'm going to be real quick with this, but they got to finish because this is the number one red zone defense in the NFL at, as far as keeping teams from scoring touchdowns. When Seattle gets inside the 20, they need to find ways to put six points on the board, not three, not zero. They have to finish drives. If they can do that, if, if they can find ways to finish off drives, especially sustained ones with possession, I like Seattle's chances of being able to win this football game. Now, let's talk defense here real quick. I think you and I would both agree, especially after the way that this matchup played out two years ago in 2019, that number 41 in the backfield, Alvin Kamara, he is the number one, number two, and number three priority to stop on Seattle's defense. And really, the, the key is simple. Uh, it's simple to say, much harder to actually do. you got to tackle Alvin Kamara, and you have to limit his yards after contact as a runner and as a receiver, especially as a receiver. That's where he murdered them two years ago. Yeah, it's not quite the same animal as Derrick Henry because, as we said before the game against the Titans, priorities 1, 2, 3, 25, 12, 75 <laughs> is to stop Derrick Henry. And you could make the same argument here with Alvin Kamara, but a much different style. It's not, you know, 35 carries and just wearing you down on defense. And just, I mean, he, he can be physical too, but he's a different running back than than Derrick Henry. There's no running back like Darren, Derrick Henry. Um, but Alvin Kamara is is a, an elite running back in his own right. And I, I agree with with the passing game, especially with Jameis Winston, who I, I just, he's not the greatest quarterback to ever play for the Saints. He's not uh, he's not one of the better quarterbacks in the NFL. Um, but he can make you pay when you make mistakes. Absolutely, he has the arm strength 
and and he he can make some some really good throws that'll that'll fit in some tight windows. Hopefully those windows tighten up into uh, Seahawks gloves that are on the football. But uh, with Alvin Kamara there, he's going to rely heavily on on Alvin Kamara, and I think that that's going to be problematic for the Seahawks because um, if you if you if it's one of those things where if you can stop Alvin Kamara and, and slow him down at least and make the Saints remotely one-dimensional with Jameis Winston, there you have him. That's how you beat New Orleans in 2021. Yeah, the Saints are ranked 31st in the NFL in passing yardage right now. They haven't been throwing the ball over the yard. They are one of the least explosive passing offenses in terms of 20-plus yard completions. I believe that they have the fourth fewest. I'd have to double-check on that, but they're in the bottom five. They have not been generating many explosive plays in the passing game. Winston's been efficient, 12 touchdowns, three picks. But if you go back and you watch the Washington game before their bye, he still threw a Jameis Winston caliber interception where he just basically he made the defender his receiver. That's <laughs> basically what happened. It was one of those where he looked like, what was he looking at type pick? So he can still uncork errant throws and make questionable decisions. And that's why the second key for me, Seattle is not known for their ability to disguise their defensive coverages, but if there's a game where you're going to be disguising your looks, this is the one. I think you can get Jameis Winston confused. You can get him off his game. And if you do that, that is when he forces those throws into coverage that he misreads and ends up getting picked. So I think disguise is going to be pivotal in this matchup. When Start out with too high and then drop Jamal Adams into Robert. Or start too high and then at the last moment, shift him up, shift your front seven. There's all kinds of different stuff you can do, but just try to keep him on his heels because I still think, I think he's a better player with Sean Payton coaching him. I think his decision-making is better, but I still think this is a kid that will uncork some passes. He will make some bad decisions if you force that issue. And I think you and I would agree as well. Another way that they can maybe get him a little rushed into those decisions, you got to be selective with it, but timely blitzes off the disguise looks to be able to get some pressure on him. Yeah, because they're, they're going to have to dial up some pressure for sure because he, he's certainly a guy that will make some some mistakes. And uh, just looking at both sides of the ball for the Saints, they are the best red zone team in football because, as you mentioned, that they're pretty stiff on on defense when, you, when you're trying to drive down and score touchdowns in the red zone. They're also the number one offense for finishing drives in the red zone as touchdowns. So they're number one. In both cat and both sides of the ball for the red for red zone touchdowns, so they know how to finish drives. So the same thing goes for the Seahawks defense. This bend don't break thing they've been breaking a lot lately. I think this is another one where that they're you gotta be laffy taffy. You gotta you gotta bend but never break. Just don't 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 let that don't let them get in the end zone because you can beat the Saints in a field goal fest. But if you let Kamara get out get out in in space and you let Jameis Winston sneak it through through a few throws behind you and finish in the red zone, that's when it's going to get ugly because they finish well in the red zone. The Seahawks haven't necessarily done that as consistently. And if you continue to let them finish drives and you don't, that that's a recipe for, for a fat L real fast. And that's really the Alvin Kamara effect when we're talking about the red zone efficiency because when you have a running back like that that can do damage both as a runner and a receiver – I've seen him a number of different times have him run Texas routes or run wheel routes out of the backfield, and then he gets against linebackers, and it's game over usually. Yeah. And so they also have a couple of tight ends that I really like. Uh, Juwan Johnson is a player that's really coming on. He's only caught six passes this year, but three of them have been touchdowns. So he has been a red zone nightmare. They've got a lot of weapons inside the 20s that are a problem. So I agree with you. Seattle wants to win this game. I actually think that might be the biggest difference maker on all these keys on both sides. Can you finish when you're inside the 20s on offense? And can you hold them back inside the 20s on defense? You do that, you trade six points for three points a couple of times. That might be what shifts the tide from having a third straight loss to getting back to three and four and feeling pretty good about yourself going into week eight. So we'll see how this plays out. But when we come back in the third quarter, we're going to look more of an individual preview here our picks to click for Monday's game on offense and defense and of course Nick will let you dish out your game prediction as well we'll be right back you're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast part of the Locked On Podcast Network your team every day this episode of Locked On Seahawks is brought to you by McDonald's proudly serving communities since 1965 
McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's a place where friends and family can come to reconnect, win or lose. It's a place where teammates, competitors, the home team or the away team can come to recharge. For me, I love washing down a great Big Mac with a large fry, maybe sneaking a McChicken in there with one of their high C lava burst orange drinks. That's one of my favorite post-game snacks. And if I'm on the road, that's one of my go-to comfort snacks. So, so head to your local McDonald's to refuel and reconnect. Did somebody say Lockdown Seahawks watch party? McDonald's, I'm loving it. If you haven't tried a Built Bar by now, you are missing out. They say it's a protein bar, but it does not taste like one. Trust me, this is an amazing bar. You have to taste it for yourself. Most protein bars are chalky or waxy or just plain hard to choke down. A Built Bar is soft, covered in 100% real chocolate, and when you bite into it, you know you're eating something different. It's more of an experience, one that you'll enjoy. In fact, you swear you're eating a candy bar. Built Bars are low-carb, low-calorie, low-fat, low-sugar, and high in protein. So all the healthy benefits on top of just being purely delicious. And there's so many great flavors, whether it's mint brownie, coconut almond, my personal favorite, peanut butter brownie. There's something out there for everybody. This month, Build is coming out with a new limited time flavor every three to four days. So check their website often. You won't want to miss out. Go to Built.com and use the promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. Welcome back to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, Blue Friday edition. I'm your host, Corbin Smith, joined by Nick Lee. Last quarter, we looked at keys to victory. Let's look at a more individual scope. Which players are going to give the Seahawks the best chance to win this football game? Our picks to click. Nick, we'll start on the offensive side of the football. Hopefully, you and I fare a little better than the last time we did this. Uh, two games ago, I was able to nail the Alex Collins pick, but... Uh, my Freddie Swain pick for the Rams game ended up being a huge miss. So the two of us are going to be trying to get back in the win column here with our picks to click. Well, I'm going to draw from that dry well that you did <laughs> with <laughs> Freddie Swain. Um, I just think it's one of those where you got, of course, you got DK Metcalf. Of course, you got Tyler Lockett. They're going to, they're, they're solid as heck. Um, and I, I just still am waiting for a third guy to, to start of emerge. We started seeing that from Freddie Swain earlier in the year. He had a 95-yard performance against the Titans, but it's kind of been going the wrong direction ever since. He had 10 yards against the Vikings, 20 yards against the Niners, and then, as you mentioned, the nine-yard performance, one catch against the Rams, and then, boy, it bottomed out against the, the, the Steelers, two catches for minus four yards. That's a robust average of minus two yards per reception. Um, so... <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm going to root for him to turn it around here. I think that this is a game where, you know, with the run game, maybe not as as great as we saw in the second half against the Steelers, just with a solid run defense in, in New Orleans. They're going to be passing the ball maybe a bit more than they like to. And Freddie Swain is going to maybe leak out and 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 be a guy that's, that's open when they're worried about DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett, maybe pop a 20-yard pass here or a 15-yard pass here, big first down there. So mine is going to be Freddie Swain. And hopefully this one turns out better than the last time we picked him. Yeah, I'm going to go down a well that hasn't fared well for me in the past either. I don't know how many times I've picked tight ends for pick to click. And then tight ends do nothing for this offense. And we've seen flashes. But I got to go with Gerald Everett because maybe one of the more disappointing things about this early portion of the season has been the fact that We've seen the tight ends look good at times, but then you'll have two or three quarters where they aren't involved in the offense at all, at least from the passing game standpoint. And Everett missed those two games on the COVID list as well. They they badly missed him. But I'm just going back to that play that he had against the Steelers last Sunday, the 41-yard reception where basically he broke four or five tackles, was dragging guys, and nearly got into the end zone. You could see the fight you can see the battle that is in this guy. And he's been so good at that throughout his NFL career. That was one thing that really stood out in his game tape from his time with the Rams is his ability to create after the catch. I mentioned in the second quarter, I think where you can beat this Saints defense with the passing game is in the intermediate, the middle level, your 10, 15, 20-yard passes between the hashes. I think that's where you can get this team. We have not seen that as a strength at all for the Seahawks on offense particularly with Russell Wilson under center. I do wonder, though, after seeing that throw that Geno Smith made to Tyler Lockett in overtime last week, which is still one of the better throws that I've seen, feathering that over the linebacker's hands, that throw makes me wonder, 
can Geno Smith attack that part of the field maybe a little bit more than what we've seen from Russell Wilson? And that means Gerald Everett and Will Disley can do damage. I just look at this defense as being one that you mentioned the third target has to step up. To me, that's Gerald Everett. And maybe it's wishful thinking, just thinking, you know, maybe the tight end will actually have a big game in the Seahawks offense. I can't remember the last time that happened, but Gerald Everett is due for a game where he explodes if Shane Waldron can get him involved and Geno Smith can get the football to him. So I guess that's my challenge to Shane Waldron, get your tight ends involved in the passing game early. And I think that the rest of your offense can feed off of that. So I think a big game coming for Gerald Everett. I'm going to go six receptions for 82 yards and a pair of touchdowns. I like it. That, that's, that's some tasty numbers there. Um, and on defense, I'm going to go with a guy who hasn't played much this year, but started to <laughs> um, and against the Steelers and um, really, really impressed. And that's Trey Brown, the cornerback. I was pretty excited watching film of him in Oklahoma when they drafted him. I thought that he's a guy that that can have that it factor, that uh, that just that edge, the playmaker kind of ability, not the biggest or strongest corner you've ever seen, but a guy that can make plays. And I think that the Seahawks are trying to go that direction beside and before or aside from going, you know, for those six two, six three corners that have these giant arms. Trey Brown on Pro Football Focus, seventy two point three grade and forty snaps against the Steelers uh, per Joe fan there on Twitter. And and you know, really that that's that's kind of what we saw. Is he, he was solid in coverage and just in a few targets he allowed just a forty seven point nine passer rating. I think that's the start of hopefully a solid career for the Seahawks. And I think this is another game, especially with how little the the Saints challenge teams downfield and and in the pass game. I think this is a game where he could maybe take advantage of that. Maybe get a pick from from Jameis Winston. You know, he he is capable, or Jameis Winston is still prone to making some of those bonehead passing decisions. He's a, he's got a rocket arm, but he sometimes uses it's that's to his detriment. And I think maybe Trey Brown makes him pay with his first NFL interception. I'm going to go up front to the defensive line. You have a very encouraging pick for yours, somebody that really shined in his debut and looked good. I'm going to go with a veteran that has been the other end of the spectrum that has disappointed this year. That has been Carlos Dunlap. No sacks through the first six games. Now, he does have 14 pressures, so I'm not going to say he's been a complete non-factor. Trey Brown, the third down tackle that he made against the Steelers in overtime, I don't think that happens without the interior pressure that was generated by Carlos Dunlap that flushed Roethlisberger from the pocket to begin with. But he's just he's been a ghost too much of this year. He's had three games where he has recorded no official statistics because pressures are not considered official. Those are, to an extent, the, those are subjective. But he's had three games where he hasn't had any tackles, hasn't had any quarterback hits hasn't had tackle for loss, passes broke up in the line, three games where he's done nothing. Carlos Dunlap needs to step up. They need him to play like he did the second half last year. This would be the perfect game to do so. He might have to deal with Ryan Ramchick. Teron Armstead could be back as well. Two really solid tackles for the Saints, but it shouldn't matter. You're supposed to be Seattle's best edge rusher. Play like it show that you can still bring it off the edge. He just hasn't done enough, but I think that changes in this game. I think that Dunlap has probably heard some of the noise coming out, and he's going to come in and have a big game. I think he gets to Jameis Winston for his first sack, and I think he gets four quarterback hits, one of them leading to an interception for none other than Trey Brown. I like it. I like the I like the cohesiveness of our two picks here. I appreciate it. <laughs> And I know, Corbin, you did your your pick on your show uh, yesterday um, as far as predictions go, so I'll, I'll give mine here. I know the crowd's going to be juiced. You know, you have Matt, like we discussed, Matt Hasselbeck, Ring of Honor, the 12th flag raising, one of the better, you know, pre-game environments in all of football. And and that's that'll get any crowd rowdy, and the Seahawks are no exception. Um, but let's be honest, the, the home mojo, even when we thought, you know, in prime time, it's just not there anymore. And at least on the field, we know the fans bring it. This is no indictment on the fans at all, but the fans absolutely bring it. Twelves are always as passionate as heck, even with a, a losing record right now. But I'm not going to say this is because of the fans, but just on the field, the home, the home team mojo, especially in, in prime time, just has not been there, uh, recently, even, um, you know, of course, during 2020, during no fans, but. Even still, with fans in the stands, unfortunately, it just has not been the case. And when you're facing a team that's 
number two in the NFL in, in run defense, and that's the one thing that you might be able to do well on offense. That's not a great recipe for success either. Um, and I, they have the ability to make the Seahawks one-dimensional, and that one dimension being Geno Smith and company. I think it's going to be another cardiac arrest of a game because <laughs> the Seahawks don't really know how to play any other game. Besides that, and especially on prime time at home, I'm going to go 27-21 Saints in a in a thrilling game. And maybe the Saints get a late touchdown to pull ahead, but I think it's going to be competitive. I think the Seahawks they absolutely have the talent to compete. Um, I, I just think that, that there's just too much working against them right now, um, and I don't think they're going to lose because of Geno Smith. I think the defense still has a lot of things to fix, and the, the Saints offense has some serious weapons that could make them pay. So I'm going to go 27-21 Saints in a really close, good game of Monday Night Football. Thanks for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen every day. Now make sure to listen to the Peacock and Williamson NFL show for your second listen. Brian Peacock and former NFL scout Matt Williamson give you the expert NFL analysis in less than 30 minutes. It's free and available on all platforms. You can follow me on Twitter, Corbin Smith NFL. You can follow Nick at Nick Lee 51. Check out Locked On Seahawks on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and the all-new Odyssey app. That's AUD. ACY coming up on Monday since the Seahawks actually play on Monday night Rob Rang and I are going to be answering your questions it's going to be an extensive Q&A show leading up to Monday night football you won't want to miss it we'll give everybody a chance to get their questions in several hours before the show as well enjoy your weekend enjoy watching all the games on Sunday without the stress of worrying what the Seahawks are going to do so enjoy your weekend thanks for listening go Hawks